Hello, welcome everyone to the second session of today as part of the inaugural Purple Tuesday Global Conference. During this session, we are going to look at the different elements needed to create an accessible customer experience. And, and as you will know, um, a customer experience is the holistic experience a customer has with a brand. It includes every interaction, whether in person or online. And for us, an accessible customer experience is providing a service with the understanding that each individual needs a slightly different accommodation. Um, and so therefore, accessible customer services is just simply good customer service. So before we start, uh, let me run through some housekeeping. This session is being recorded and will be shared with you after the event. Captions are enabled, so turn them on in your viewing panel in uh, Zoom if required. And there will be time for a Q&A at the end of the session. And we really do want this to be absolutely interactive. So please do get your question, questions in, put them into the Q&A or chat box, and we will pick them up at the end of the session. I would also like to take this opportunity to extend a huge thanks to our headline partner, eBay or global partners, Standard Chartered Bank, SHL, and the Hidden Disability Sunflower Scheme, and to all of our national partners, which you can see here, representing a real diverse cross-section of industries across the UK, US, and the UAE. Without their contribution today, this conference would just simply not be possible. So joining me on the panel, we have Tizzy Banner, who is a support manager at Smartbox. And Smartbox provide a range of accessible devices to help those with out of voice to communicate and to live more independently. We have Ed Warner, who is the founder and CEO of Motion Spot, that provides inclusive design consultancy and innovative accessibility products. We have Paula Bobbitt, who is the Chief Digital Officer at Boots, uh, the UK's leading health and beauty care retailer. We have Ross Calladine, Head of Business Support at Visit England, and Marina de Duca, Inclusive Tourism Manager at Visit Scotland, who are national tourism agencies that are helping to raise awareness and profile of tourism in England and Scotland. And finally, we have Matthew Yates, General Counsel at Whitbread, who is the owner of the Premier Inn, the UK's biggest hotel brand. I am also delighted that we will be joined by um, a, one of our Purple Tuesday Disabled Customer Ambassadors. Uh, we will hear from Fred Maz, who is a recognised leader in the international disability community and an, an accessible travel expert. Unfortunately, Seema Flower, who would have been at, uh, uh, joining us today, has taken on well and is no longer available to be part of the panel. So without further ado, let's go to the panel. Um, I'm going to start with you, Tizzy, uh, to ask you a few questions. Welcome, Tizzy. Hi, Charlene. What do you think are the core principles needed in providing an accessible customer experience? Thanks very much. So, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having Smart Box at the Purple Tuesday Conference. Um, over the many years of me being with Smart Box and Custom Service, and I've now done this for nearly 12 years, um, some of the core principles that are needed that we found are be welcoming, actively listen to customers, um, give customers as much time as they need, um, don't try and wrap up phone calls really quickly or anything like that, um, have multiple methods of, of, for customers to actually communicate and contact us, um, allow inclusive communication sharing so that we can share information in a way that everyone can understand. And also on the other side of it, making sure that staff have all the support that they need to best be able to communicate with their customers. Yeah, absolutely. And so we know, um, um, obviously, Smartbox creates some fantastic um, uh, assistive technologies to support yeah individuals with their communication. So can you tell me how Smartbox has implemented these principles for the non-speaking disability community? Of course I can. So 
just to give a little bit of background in case anyone doesn't know much about Smartbox or but they're not aware of who we are. We're a company that create assistive technology and that help individuals and, and disabled people to communicate and be as independent as they can. Um, we've got a range of both hardware and software solutions that are used all over the world. We work in over 40 countries and we deliver software and devices internationally. And our software is also in around about 30 languages. So there's plenty of options there for people to communicate all around the world. So going back to, the, to the, those principles, we know their accessibility is there. And we've obviously already got sort of like digital accessibility with alt text. And we've got physical accessibility with sort of ramps and disabled access. Um, and more places are considering these. However, we still find that there isn't as much discussion around the communication challenges that are faced by individuals who are either nonverbal or just face communication challenges. And they have that right to receive that same quality of customer service that anyone else does. So at Smartbox, we pride ourselves on our customer support and have options to help and support customers as best as possible. And I've got a few examples and a few tips that we've tried before um, to give you some ideas that hopefully we'll be able there just to give some other, other companies um, suggestions of what could also be tried to help them grow as much as possible too. So talking about our training, first of all, all our staff when they join us are introduced to what we class as AAC or Augmentative and Alternative Communication Technology. Um, they have they learn about how customers can communicate, whether that's via switch or touch using symbols or text. Um, and we have done with them um, communication access training, which uses the talk principles. So that is um, time to communicate, asking how they prefer to communicate, listening and keep trying. And we've all done that so that we can learn as much as possible. Um, Staff also have the opportunity to use the devices um, to develop their knowledges. And what we have tried, and we do this with some, certainly we do this with some of our new staff, is that we've used what we class our coffee challenge, where they go out into the community with the AAC devices or the software and actually go and order the coffee for the rest of the team as a chance to see how they how can they experience their, 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 um, their customer service. So we do coffee challenges. We have um, coffee breaks where it is just AAC device only. So no verbal speech, but just a chance to actually just communicate through the devices and see how everyone gets on. Um, and one, when we have done through, when we previously had um, AAC Awareness Month, which is October, um, we have also done support via AAC devices. So one of my colleagues actually um, did all her support for the day via the device to actually talk to the other end of the customer. So even if we were talking to therapists or families or anything like that, the other end of the phone, they also got to experience talking to an individual with, with a device. Um, so the other things we've run, uh, we've done phone training with our, with our teams um, because it can be a little unfamiliar to talk to customers who might have um, no speech or limited speech. Um, so we offer them nice tips to give them a helping hand. One of my favorite tips, and we do this all the time with support, is if we get a phone call where it's sort of silent at the other end of the phone, um, we make sure we wait sort of 30 seconds to a minute before we hang that phone call up, um, just to give a customer at the other end of that phone a chance to construct their sentence or talk about anything. Um, they just need a bit more time. So we don't want to think, oh, it's a dead phone call, we should hang it up. No, they just, we just need to see if, it, if we unwait. Um, and to go with that, to, to help with that familiarity, um, we did also offer that um, any, of the, any of our staff could have a sort of pre-arranged conversation with a user with an AAC device or, or limited speech, just to practice, not on those terms of, I need actual support at that particular point, but just to have a chat and be able to be a bit more familiar as to how you should, how you should approach it, or you should wait for a little bit of time and just give you a bit more time. Um, we also know that visual aids are popping up more and more around the, 
around the community, uh, for example, in playgrounds. And via our grid software, um, we have resources already set up for things like playgrounds and restaurants, shops, and they can be either online on their devices or as a printable resource in case the machine can't go to that location. Not very practical if you want to take your device in the bath, not always. Um, but the, these grids can also be really quickly personalised, so it could easily be that it could be updated for a shopping list if you're going into a shop to be able to allow them to communicate as best as possible to get that customer experience. Um, from supporting customers, um, we, we know there's a, a wide range of, and benefit of actually having customers be able to communicate with many, us with many different options. Um, so we offer those different options in terms of phone, online chat, via Facebook, via email, um, booked in sessions if you want to have things pre-recorded, pre um, and also the options of just being able to do things via a remote session if they need to um, let us look at the device so they can talk to us directly. Um, we do find and we do try consciously, um, and this has come over practice, that we consciously talk to the user themselves the, the, because it is better for us to talk to them rather than relying on their family and carer and they get that more personal approach um, and also it can be a little bit of Chinese whispers otherwise by the time the individual has then explained it to the family and then explained it to us that actually if we just speak to them directly we're probably they're going to get a better support out of it and they're going to feel more valued in the fact that we're happily helping them and listening to them. One other feature that we've got in our grid software that has helped us and helped customers improve their independence as well is that we can allow customers to phone us or other companies directly with their devices um, and it allowing them to actually use their synthesized speech on the devices to communicate with us. Um, hence why we do that phone training because of talking about synthesized speech. But it does mean that their independence is greatly improved um, because they're not relying on someone else to have to be in the room or to have to come in at a particular time of the day to be able to contact us. Um, and the other bit which we've got is um, via our support on our website. As I mentioned, we have our online chat, which is really widely used and allows our ind individuals themselves to actually type on it directly. Um, and it also can support multiple languages, which is really handy for them as well in case English isn't their first language. Um, but, and also with our website to help with that inclusive communication, um, we're always looking at better ways to make it improve it, add more alt text. And certainly with the support guides, we wanted to focus on adding more sort of videos and photos to help support people as best as possible because people learn in different ways and want different support in different ways. Um, they, I hope that gives you a few tips and shows you a few of the principles there to give you an idea as to what other companies can also put into practice. Wow, thank you, Tizzy. Gosh, <laughs> there was a lot in there and um, really appreciate it right from, you know, you know, taking the time to give people yeah. time to respond, communicating directly with your customer. Um, and I think fundamentally upskilling and training and building the disability confidence of your staff is it's fundamental to be able is, to yeah, deliver uh, yeah. that, that good uh, customer experience. Thank you so much. Um, Not a I'd problem. Like, <laughs> I'd now like to welcome Ed uh, from Motion Spot uh, for a, a quick chat. So Ed, obviously Motion Spot is absolutely about accessible design. Um, but how do you go about uh, incorporating great design and great look and still make it fully accessible? Hi, Charlene. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me on. Delighted to be supporting Purple Tuesday today. Um, for those of you that know me, I'm super passionate about the design of really beautiful, accessible spaces. Uh, for the last 10 years, uh, that's what our business most of has been doing. I set the business up 10 years ago after the personal experience of our co-founder and old school friend of mine, James Taylor, who uh, experienced a spinal cord injury in a diving accident, age 25, returned home to his flat in South London as a wheelchair user to find his home looking like a clinical care home, full of all the kit that has predominantly been synonymous with sort of disability and ageing. And 
Um, that was what inspired us to look differently at this sector and to, and, and to really kind of work with clients to blend form and function together to create really beautiful, accessible spaces. So it's very much within our values as a business. I suppose the three areas of, of advice I would give in answer to your question are, are around thinking about accessible design at the earliest stage of a design project. Uh, accessible design doesn't have to cost any more if it's thought about early on in a new build or a refurbishment. Uh, I'd also urge people to think about designing accessible spaces that go beyond minimum standards of building regulation. Um, certainly in the UK and US and also in the Middle East, building regulations have traditionally been focused around um, designs for physical disabilities. And as we know, you know, design for disability is, is so much broader than design for, for, for wheelchair users alone. So you know, think about how you can design really beautiful spaces that will work for wheelchair users as well as anyone else with a cognitive sensory um, uh, need, including neurodiversity, which I know you've got a session on uh, later on in the day. And, and the third area I'd, I'd say is to really get creative about the types of products you put into your spaces, whether they are workplaces or hotels. There's some amazingly innovative products on the market. There's some brilliant technology coming to market that can be harnessed and designed together to create really kind of beautiful, accessible spaces for everyone. Oh, thank you very much. Sorry, I was just distracted. Somebody popped into the room there, uh, the virtual room. Um, yeah, so um, we would love to know how um, um, how you've been involved in the design of accessible rooms that have been a commercial success. Um, you know, as you said, and, and I think that is um, a really true point. You know, accessible design doesn't necessarily mean to cost more, but can it mean that it can mean it's it's more commercial uh, for uh, an opportunity for those organisations? It very much can, Charlene, and, and I'll pass it a common to talk about some data that we've been running over the last couple of years around return on investment for clients, because as you rightly say, clients should be doing this because it's right for everybody and it's designed mm -hmm. to be spaces for everyone, but at the end of the day, businesses have to make money as well and, and there has to, has to be a commercial success as part of it. Um, I, I suppose over the last 10 years, we've been working with with companies across the UK and around the world to help them design um, you know, their accessible spaces. And mm -hmm. conscious that Ross from Visit England and Marina are, are about to speak after me, if I kind of focus this example more around hospitality, which is an area that most of have been doing a lot of work in over the last 10 years. Um, the, the, before we get to kind of the commercial success, we've got to get the access right within these hotels and accommodation providers. So, Type of work we would do is um, is around helping clients design bedrooms and bathrooms that are accessible. Uh, again, not looking institutional in their design look and feel. Um, thinking about bathrooms in particular, which can look rather clinical um, uh, in their design um, in their design feel. Uh, introducing really innovative products like removable grab rails and shower seats that can be hooked on and taken off when someone doesn't require and the same amount of access in the room. We've been looking at designing out red pull cords that um, get tied up, misused, difficult to clean with more stylish, accessible push button systems. Uh, we've worked with hotels to put in really clever ceiling track voice that can disguise within a bit of joinery. So if you were in bed and you didn't need a hoist, you wouldn't know it was there, but the facility is there for someone with a more complex disability to access that bedroom. And then also thinking about other communal areas like uh, getting the design of your reception and welcome area right, not just for wheelchair users, but for, 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 for a range of, 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 um, of other disabilities. Uh, and thinking about the small details like the acoustics and the lighting and the type of materials you use all contribute to creating a, a really welcoming customer experience within hospitality. Similar principles run through the workplaces, I, I must add. When it comes to the commercial success bit, this has been really interesting. So um, we've been working with uh, a big hotel in Manchester, uh, in the north of, 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 of England, for, for anyone dialing in internationally today. Um, and the hotel is called Hotel Brooklyn, and, and they've got nine wheelchair accessible bedrooms and bathrooms, and nine ambulance accessible bedrooms and bathrooms. 
And over the last year, they've run data that shows that their accessible rooms have generated £10,000 of revenue per month. Um, and their, their events where a member of the booking party had a disability has generated an additional £50,000 of revenue for them over the first year. So that's £170,000 of revenue from putting in those accessible rooms. Um, and, and, and the other return on investment stat I always love, I was up with a client in, in Glasgow recently, a major workplace client, um, client in the FTSE 100, and they said for every pound that they spend on accessible design, it saved them £100 in retrofits at a later stage. So I'd really be thinking about that, going back to that point I made earlier about thinking about accessible design at an early stage. Wow, that's amazing. Like clearly the numbers show that uh, by investing in accessible design, there's clearly a return on that investment. And, you know, if there's any organizations that are sitting there and they're about to undertake a refurb of, or, or they're about to do a new build, it's about getting that design into the earliest possible phase uh, to be able to get the biggest impact and, and the return on your investment. Thank you, Ed. I th that was that was very uh, amazing. Thank you very much. And now I want to introduce Paula uh, from Boots. Hi, Paula. Hi, Charlene. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Welcome uh, to today's session. So I know that Boots have made significant changes to your digital sites um, and have become a lot more accessible. I think it'd be really um, great if you could just share what you have actually done. Yeah, no problem. So um, we've installed a website accessibility tool called Recite Me, um, and it provides every online user with tools that they can use to, I guess, improve the accessibility and inclusivity of their experience on our website. Um, so it includes things like reading the content out loud and changing some aspects of the website. So you can change like colours or font types, um, or even you can amend the language as well. So Resign Me can translate our website into over 100 um, different languages um, and 35 different languages also that which can be read aloud. Um, we have something like 10,000 visitors to boots.com who actually use the tool um, and it covers over 50,000 pages of our website, which is incredible. Um, language actually is the most important um, or popular tool at the moment um, and we're seeing obviously our content translating into multiple different languages for our customers but also we also see a men's to font size and appearance being used as well and um, we're looking to like expand our partnership out with Resiami into some of our partner websites such as online doctor as well um, so that that's one thing and um, the other thing is that we're working really closely with um, the digital accessibility center um, so they work with both public, private and voluntary sectors to create digital experiences that meet sort of best practice accessibility standards and legislation. So they're a team of accessibility specialists and they are very passionate about inclusion and digital accessibility. And actually the majority of their user testing team actually have a disability so they can bring that first hand experience to the role. Um, so we try and build that into everything we do in terms of our design. And we um, kind of bear in mind, I guess, considering accessibility for things like key visual accessibility requirements, such as like colour contrast and ratios or logical tab sequence of pages um, and things like focus state indicators for actual elements and clear labelling, font sizes, text hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So I've been working really closely with them actually for the last two years um, to really help our digital development be more inclusive um, and accessible to our users. So we have a specialist who provides that dedicated consultancy. Um, so they give us the guidance and the testing. Um, so right from actually the initial UX designs all the way through to development. Um, we're definitely a long way from perfect. Um, and we acknowledge that. But we are you know, working actually towards um, getting the... Um, WCAG AA compliancy and um, that's kind of our, our goal and our passion and commitment um, so as a team we really champion accessible experiences for all um, I think working with DSA has really helped you know communicate the importance of it as well and sort of bringing it to life with a lot of our stakeholders throughout the business um, and based on like the user insight we get from the DAC insights, we make sure they're, you know, we prioritise those key accessibility improvements um, in our product backlog so that we can make sure that we are increasingly becoming more accessible for our customers. Um, 
so examples of, of some of the improvements we've made so um, we have new notifications so that announce their appearance to screen readers and um, for users who are unaware of this important notification um, we make complex components more accessible to screen and keyboard users um, we provide further context to things like navigation items and we make sure that our content is a res responsive and presented without a lot of information lots of different screen sizes um, so it's something we're very passionate about um, and Boots as a whole is, is you know, very passionate about that. Um, we are obviously trying to do that not just on our digital experience, but actually what we do in stores as well. So we've got um, several initiatives to support our disabled colleagues. Um, so things like work um, place adjustment processes and support passports. Um, we also champion the Hidden Disability Sunflower Scheme um, and the Alzheimer's Society's Dementia Friends. So we're making sure that we're supporting our customers with non-visible, I guess, disabilities. Mm -hmm. It's our second year, I think, working with you um, as a sort of a partner in the health and beauty sector. Um, and really excitingly, actually, earlier this year, the, the Cabinet Office um, Disability Unit appointed our HR Director to be the accessibility champion for retail. Um, so I think it's something, you know, Boots as a business is really, really passionate about. As I said, there's still a lot more to do, um, but we're definitely focusing on making those improvements. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Paula. And I think there's something that we, you know, need to get across to everybody joining in today. Disability inclusion is about going on a journey. Uh, and it's about recognizing that it's about continual development. It's about continually building your capacity and your understanding um, so that you become more accessible and more uh, inclusive year on year. And, you know, I don't think we ever finally meet that, you know, um, utopia of uh, absolute full accessibility because improvements can continually be made. So, uh, you know, I think, you know, you, you, um, you brought it across lovely in terms of like, it is about going on that continual um, uh, development. And there's something I just want to highlight as well. It's the involvement of disabled user testers in your processes, making sure that you get the involvement and, and the experience, the real experience of, uh, of those with disabilities in engaging with your products and your services and you know as a customer but also as an employee as well it's just making sure that there's always that involvement um, and from the in, from the disability community because that real lived experience is absolutely is what's going to take you to that next level and and, and really enhance ha enhance everything and yes we're delighted to be continuing to be working with with Boots as well for for another year as part of Purple Tuesday so thank you very much um I'm now going to welcome uh Ross and Marina uh, from Visit England and Visit Scotland to to join us for uh, a, a quick chat hi Ross hi Charlene thanks for having us yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I'm delighted that uh, Visit England, Visit Scotland are uh, the tourism partner for Purple Tuesday again this year. And, you know, the tourism and hospitality sector is, is, is all about delivering great experiences and, and great memories. And, but, but what would you say are the key accessibility challenges and, and changes in disability that you've seen in the sector? Sure. Uh, well, as you say, Visit England and Visit Scotland, we're the national tourism boards for both England and Scotland. So we're all about supporting holidays and tourism in England and Scotland. Um, we've both got long standing work programmes in this space. So we're providing lots of direction, guidance and support to both tourism businesses, such as accommodation, hotels, bed and breakfast, self catering, visitor attractions of all different shapes and sizes and also the destinations themselves. And that's to help them harness the, the accessible tourism market because it's really important and it's really valuable to them. I'm pleased to say we've seen lots of progress um, over the last few years on the accessibility front. As you say, it's a never ending journey, so there's still lots more to do. Um, but yeah, lots of good, good progress being made. Just to touch on some of the areas we're seeing differences being made, we are seeing an increasing understanding that putting the customer first and understanding their own individual requirements can really lead to greater access and inclusion and more quality um, experiences, which is, as you say, is what tourism is all about, having fun and making memories. Um, I think also there's a greater appreciation that we're talking about a really broad spectrum of accessibility requirements. So we're seeing provision not only for those with mobility impairments, but people with sensory impairments and neurodiversity, 
and anyone with an access requirement, whether or not they relate to language or disability, for example. There's more of a realisation that it's not just the right thing to do, but actually it's really good for business. And Ed touched on this. There is a huge untapped market. Um, and in many ways, that's growing because there's an ageing population. Um, there's popularity of multi-generation holidays. Um, and it helps businesses, obviously, to be legal because of the, the obligations under the Equality Act. It contributes to social well-being, and that helps local communities as well as visitors. And it just helps businesses be more resilient as well because this market tends to be more loyal. They are not tied to peak periods as much, so they can help spread um, tourism throughout off-peak periods. So we say it's a, a bit of a no-brainer. Um, and pre-COVID, the market was worth over 15 billion pounds a year in England and over 1 billion pounds in Scotland. And we want to try and build that back, obviously. Um, the government, they've demonstrated some good political will. So they have an ambition for the UK to become the most accessible destination in Europe. Um, and a recent really good activity from them was the Change in Places Toilets Fund. Um, and round one is seeing 500 new toilets being built uh, and these toilets are just so important and they make the difference of some people being able to take a day trip or a holiday um, in the UK so we really support that. Um, Ed touched on this uh, so I, I won't say much but we're seeing a trend that more holiday accommodation is being developed that is design-led so it doesn't have that clinical feel um, and that's a, because of a greater appreciation of something called universal design so it's about making accommodation inclusive for as many people as possible, rather than saying you have to do something exclusively for, for disabled people. And as Ed said, Hotel Brooklyn in Manchester is, is a really good, good example of that. A um, couple more points finally. Um, there's been some great progress by local tourism destinations. Uh, in England, we've seen lots of good activity in Derbyshire and the Peak District. And Visit England is currently running a project in the North York Moors where we're developing and promoting accessible tourism itineraries and just started promoting those uh, domestically. And we'll also be doing some promotion in the Netherlands, which is which is exciting. Um, and finally, I think we've made some really good strides in marketing of accessible tourism. So in recent years, we've um, worked with Channel 4 on the hugely successful Mission Accessible social media series and that was fronted by comedian Rosie Jones and if anyone hasn't seen uh, that campaign uh, do have a look on, on Channel 4 on demand Mission Accessible. So yeah just sharing with you there some of the recent changes I think uh, in, tour in the tourism industry on accessible tourism. Yeah, no, thank you, Ross. And, and, and I have to say, yeah, you know, we have seen such a, a change in, in recent years with uh, the levels of accessibility right across uh, hospitality and tourism. And, and as we say, we, we know there's more to be done, um, but uh, certainly there has been great strides uh, moving forward. And I just want to point up in, the, in one of the points that you said about marketing uh, accessible tourism. It's all great doing all this amazing stuff, making your place and investing in your destination and making it accessible and then not telling anybody about it. And, you know, um, communication is key and getting that message out there and looking at the channels of communication as well to make sure that you're attracting the widest possible um, uh, uh, base um, uh, to, to come to your destination. Thank you, Ross. Uh, and Marina, hi. Hi, Welcome. hi. Uh, I hope you're well. Um, so um, in terms of like the um, an accessible customer experience, it often begins at the research stage uh, of a holiday and a visit. As I said, you know, just before, you know, yeah. if you're marketing, you're going to be going out and looking to find what's yeah. going to meet your needs. So how can businesses ensure experience accessible right from the point of the first interest of travel? Yeah. Okay, really good question. Um, so first impressions are always important. So getting it right and creating the right welcome online is just as important as in person. And it's important really at that stage to train your back office staff in digital accessibility and language so that you project the right kind of welcome that you want to, to, to do both in person and online. And your website is your shop window. 
So you want to ensure that you're, that you're welcoming everyone in. But we are aware that in the hospitality industry, for example, there are lots of SMEs and um, they have long-standing websites that are maybe not accessible. But there are ways around to reach out and make sure that you are really welcoming and attracting accessible visitors. So if you know your site isn't fully accessible, then make sure that you have other ways of um, accessible visitors contacting you and having a website and sorry, having an email and having a telephone number on your homepage and allowing people to contact you via different means is really important. It also means that um, that contact us feature is really available on the first click when they come into your website. The other thing that you really want to do is make sure that you are telling customers about the facilities that you have. It's as important to tell them what you don't have as what you do have. So accessible uh, facilities that you have, services are all really important. And to create that in some sort of accessibility guide is really the way to do that. And there are organizations that can do that for you, um, such as Accessable, but also Visit England and Visit Scotland got together a few years ago and we create a free tool that hospitality businesses can use with set questions. It creates a digital guide then you add the link to that guide onto your home page. Again, it allows the visitor to know exactly the facilities that you have on the ground, which is so important to unlock that potential for them. The other thing that you can do is add metadata and image tags to your images and make sure that you create the right kind of imagery that supports what you're saying online. So if you have an accessible room, add pictures to that accessible room and make that really available up front. Don't, don't hide it away deep into your website. If you have um, information about your venue and how to get to your venue and adding accessible transport links, um, facilities about accessible parking, anything that you have in your vicinity and your location, that adds that sort of um, fuller holiday experience, add that to your website as well. So really the important thing is to make sure that your customer journey end to end is in as inclusive as you can make it. And it's not about um, adding lots um, of, of extra budget into creating your website um, and making it accessible overnight, because that's, that's going to be a journey, as we've talked about across all the sessions here today, that it is about a journey. But if you're not, if you're not on the journey, you're never going to get to that end destination. Mm -hmm. And that's really of value to, to society and to, to, to all of us across the piece, as, as, as Ross has said, and has Ed and all the other panellists have said today. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, you know, one of the things when I speak to businesses um, all the time about uh, disability, uh, disability inclusion, I'm like, just get started, get moving, yes. get going. Um, and it's like small, consistent steps um, uh, that you make that will have a huge impact um, as you as you uh, um, travel yes. down, travel down that journey. And, and one of the, and the key thing, I think, Marina, that you're getting across here, information is key <laughs> if you don't share the information then yeah. um the, the, your visitor or the, uh, those who are accessing your products and services will not know what to expect and and it's when our expectations are not met yeah um that we are disappointed um and so it's better to be honest and upfront and be quite clear and say, as you said don't hide it away on your website you know yeah. if you've got an accessible toilet share that you've got an accessible yeah. toilet yeah. And, and 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 making it quite clear so that the visitor or the person that is going to be coming to your business absolutely understands what to expect before they before they arrive and so thank you so much uh marina uh, and ross for that um, i'm now going to move on to matthew uh from whitspread welcome matthew hi charlene hi everyone thanks for having me on yeah, no, really, really good uh, to have you here today, Matthew. Um, uh, obviously, we have welcomed Whitbread um, uh, as a Purple Tuesday uh, partner. And um, what what I think would be really useful uh, for the, the audience here today is if you could share the disability inclusion journey that Whitbread is on and the process that you have undertaken to make the decision to become a Purple Tuesday uh, partner. Yeah, sure. Um, well, as everyone's kind of said, it is a journey. 
and we've been on that journey for quite for quite a while now um, it's always been an area of, of focus um, for a combination of things both in terms of as Ed said kind of compliance with law but also trying to kind of do the right do also do the right thing um, from a, from a people perspective we we have a very diverse background of people working for us anyway due to the kind of nature of the roles and um, geographic kind of disbursement of, of properties um, with the number of rooms we've got both in the UK and, and kind of Germany now. Um, it's fair to say that historically we've um, always had some difficulty from a kind of guest perspective, never really knowing if we were kind of doing the right thing, noting that individ individual guests need a, a wide variety of kind of adjustments and and, and we simply just can't um, provide for all of those and there's almost um, not being fearful of that but constantly trying to improve our our position so there's been a kind of bit of a shift in in mindset as as well um you know we've we've got some really important external um partnerships with colleges like derwin and Harrowood uh, for learning difficulties we've got a three-bedroom hotel at derwin um where students can um um work out the skills and 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 we have had a few of those actually join us in kind of full and kind of part-time part-time roles which has been fantastic and we're looking at expanding that that initiative um for the last two years um we've definitely dialed up um how we're looking at guests and team members we have recognized that there is a lack of diversity in our decision makers which is not unusual for a kind of a large organization um, but it does we recognize that it does do our disabled guests um, a, a disservice um, and partnerships we developed partnerships with um, the business disability forum that's been fundamental in terms of obtaining their input in both people and guest policy process and, and design um, we've also formalized the enable network which i'm chair of to improve accessibility for both those with um, hidden and visible um, disabilities. Um, I think we've become, become less afraid of getting it wrong. We've actually looked for opportunities to improve. Um, for example, with guest complaints, we use those as an opportunity to learn and improve. So our DNI Centre of Excellence, they now support those guest complaints um, relevant to disability. Um, we've also started asking optional identity questions in both guest and team surveys so we can understand the actual experience of those disabled teams and guests so listening understanding and actioning on, on those improvements um, the last part is where as I mentioned enable comes in so I, I'm very proud to kind of chair that um, and that's really focused on action so we're making changes that, that really make some difference we're organised into four work streams, people, guest, tech and partnerships. We are a clicks and bricks business. 98% of our bookings come through our, our website, which is unique in the kind of hospitality industry and in the hotel industry. Um, and um, we've got some fantastic exec sponsorship, which is kind of where it comes on to the Purple Tuesday piece in terms of joining you as the kind of hospitality sector partner this year. Um, which has really enabled us to um, regather some focus. We've chosen the Hidden Disabilities Sunflower as the commitment for this year. We think that will make a massive improvement in terms of um, our, both um, the awareness within our, with our team members, um, but also in terms of the guest experience and, in fact, and also the team, team member experience. So we think that will make a massive difference. Um, and we've also, um, we had a number of sites that have independently gone off and done their own disability confidence scheme piece but we've now kind of brought that in centrally and we've started on that journey as well so as everyone kind of said it is a journey and we're um, firmly on it and we're looking forward to celebrating with you on the 1st of November. Absolutely gosh uh, there, there's a lot going on there as well and uh, I think the the key things for, my, for me is um, um, building on uh, partnerships having that outside area of expertise coming in and working with you and supporting the organization um, on the journey um, and bringing the, um, the expertise around accessibility, inclusion, policy process into the business is absolutely, is absolutely fundamental. I think, you know, uh, understanding that 
uh, from our point of view is there's no such thing as a bad complaint. It's just an opportunity to learn and an opportunity to learn. And, and actually embracing that is really, really important. And hearing from the lived experience of your customers is, 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 is the only way really you know, things are going to uh, uh, move forward. And, um, and, and, and again, and I, it's just to point out to the people in the room, enable is your, is your employee network, isn't it? That, that is helping inform and, and inspire the, the, the business in terms of that, the voice of your people, <laughs> essentially helping uh, drive the changes needed within the business. Yeah, and we've chosen the, the makeup of that to also include people with lived experiences as well, just Absolutely. to ensure we've got the full extent of it. And I think I saw one of the Q&As from, um, I think it was Ruben, in respect of accessible kind of parking bays. Um, you know, that's, for example, is an issue that's kind of been brought up recently. And um, we found that our team members have been slightly over the top in terms of their approach to protecting those parking spaces, which has brought other problems in respect to those with hidden disabilities. So we've kind of had to take that, learn lessons from it. And we're at, at the moment kind of developing a process which we can roll out to sites to to kind of improve those areas. So. It's both, um, you know, there's a little bit of reactiveness in there, but, but yeah. also a proactiveness with the nature of the group. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and that all comes then with the building of the disability confidence and the understanding of your staff and, and who get more experience in, in, in delivering that. Thank you so much, Matthew. It's been Thank really, really help, helpful. Um, unfortunately, uh, Fred isn't able to join us uh, in person uh, today um, because he's... Uh, calling them from the States and it's still in the middle of the night for, for him. But he has very kindly put together a, a short video, which I would love to uh, share with you now, um, because it, it really shares his story, his experience as a, a, as a disabled customer and, and provides some lovely advice to, to business. So we'd like to share this now. Hi, my name is Fred Moss. When I was 18 years old, just a few days before starting my first year of college, literally on the last day of vacation with my family and friends, I dove from a boat, not knowing that the water was only a foot deep. So when I dove, uh, hit my head, uh, broke my neck and became paralyzed from the chest down and have used a wheelchair ever since. After spending seven months in the hospital, trying to regain my strength and to become as independent as possible, I found that the world wasn't built for me. That began my journey to become a disability advocate and champion. I spent over 30 years in the corporate world here in the US, traveling the world as part of my job, uh, and all the while uh, realizing and understanding what accessibility meant around the world. While doing my job, it, it felt like what I was doing for the disability community was only part-time. So three years ago, I left corporate to start my own consulting business and uh, have grown that to become an internationally recognized disability advocate and champion focusing on accessible travel and tourism. So I think that travel organizations need to work more closely with businesses uh, impacted directly by uh, the, the travel industry. So for instance, um, it, it, it's one thing for a, a travel organization to say, Oh, sure, that hotel, that restaurant, that museum, et cetera, is accessible. Um, and then we, we get there and we find out that it's not. Uh, I think there, there needs to be better education, better communication uh, between entities. Uh, and as a, as a population, I think the disability community uh, must do a better job of educating those entities about what accessibility truly means. For the travel industry, the sky's the limit. Uh, you know, there are so many people around the world who want to travel, literally millions of people with disabilities who want to travel, but can't because places either are not accessible or the ones that are accessible aren't really promoting it. They're not telling us exactly how they are accessible so we can come, we can enjoy, we can spend our money uh, and, uh, and just, you know, level the playing field for everyone. Recently, there are a, a couple of businesses and, and organizations that come to mind who've gone above and beyond my expectations when it comes to serving a person with a disability. For instance, 
during a recent uh, travel uh, to Dubai, the airline that I flew on was just phenomenal. They, they greeted me at the door of the plane. They immediately sent a team over to ask how they could best assist me. And throughout my flight, a very long flight, by the way, from the U.S., uh, they were they checked on me. They uh, asked if there was anything they could do. They made sure that my needs, my comfort uh, was really a concern. Uh, and I felt really valued as a customer. And then uh, actually during that same trip, when I got to a hotel, a five star hotel, I found that uh, as, as a person who usually travels by themselves uh, with a disability using a wheelchair, some things can be a little tricky in the hotel room and, and in the bathroom of the hotel uh, room. So I, I asked the manager if it was possible, if they would consider purchasing a shower commode chair that I could use by myself to be independent and use it safely. Without, without even batting an eye, uh, the manager said, absolutely, we can do that for you. Uh, and then asked me what time my meetings were. I, I let her know what time my meetings were, and she assured me that by the time I got back from my meetings, that shower commode chair would be in my room. And sure enough, it was. So uh, this is not common. You, you can't usually get that type of um, not only customer experience, but, but really having someone understand what your needs are that clearly and immediately acting upon it without question uh, to, to make sure that, number one, your needs are met, uh, but number two, uh, that you know, everyone is safe and, and as comfortable as they should be. I support Purple Tuesday for so many reasons. First and foremost, the disability population globally is a tour de force. So if we look at numbers and we, we estimate numbers, we believe that there are about 1.4 billion people living in the world with some type of disability. When you add to that number, their family members and caregivers, that's about another 20% of the population. So very quickly, you're at about 40% of the global population with a spending power of close to $8 trillion US. Think about that. Eight trillion dollars U.S., but they're only spending about 43 percent of that, and that's because places aren't accessible, or places that are accessible aren't promoting it as they should, or, or doing enough uh, to make sure that people, regardless of ability, are included. So we need to do something about that, and I think Purple Tuesday is the perfect way to bring attention to the disability population, our spending power. And, and what things can be done to make sure that we are included as, as customers, as everyone else. You know, we, we do have money, we do want to spend, we do want to travel, we do want to enjoy everything that everyone else does. And by having this, this event, this global event, you know, kicking off this November 1st, I can't think of a better way than Purple Tuesday bringing attention to all of that. Wow, that's amazing. Um, I really, um, I really uh, valued what Fred had to say, and I think if there's ever a, a statistic that you want to pull out to uh, again highlight the business case for uh, accessibility and inclusion, it is the eight trillion uh, disability market that is available worldwide. Um, and the fact that only 43% of it is actually being spent is just uh, phenomenal in, in terms of uh, the business case, why you know to take steps in, in improving accessibility uh, and improving the, the customer experience for, for people with, uh, with disabilities. We have a little bit of time for a few questions. Um, I've seen um, some have popped up. So I'm going to uh, go to, um, I'm going to, who am I going to pick on? <laughs> um, I think I'll start with, with uh, you, um, Tizzy. Um, just let me get this. Yeah. So uh, Tizzy, the, the question to you was, um, do you liaise with um, other people in, across the world um, just to make sure that different or organizations um, understand um, the, the needs of people with communication difficulties? Um, so nice question um sort of a, it's a, a yes and a could do better kind of answer i think for this so 
yes we do talk to other companies um we have another company over in germany that we um we've recently uh, acquired last year and we've now done a lot more with them and helping them sort of improve support and learn from them at the same time we have partners all around the world who obviously sell our software and hardware that we meet with um regularly and actually meeting actually in real life in person in a couple of weeks time at our actual partner conference which is going to be great to um to actually talk to them and hear more from them directly um but also i think it's a we could do better kind of answer that um we do obviously go out and do a lot of stuff with nhs and schools and share things there but it's something also that's not really talked about and not shared enough that kind of feels like it's a this is a great stepping stone to do something much bigger yeah absolutely uh possibly we work together and we we we, we look to uh, engage more with the, the the corporate world uh outside of the, the you know that public uh, sector medical world to to highlight the, the the need for accessible communications and 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 delivering really good customer experiences for those who who aren't able to communicate um yeah. uh, verbally um thanks thanks tizzy and i yeah. have a question for uh ed um so um the, understandably uh you work with hospitality um in terms of your industry so the question is do you speak with construction companies uh, in order to challenge them in their processes uh, to make buildings more accessible? That's a, a really good question about construction companies because ultimately the contractor has such a responsibility to build whatever the development is to be accessible. The, the answer to the question is yes. Uh, so we are talking to contractors. I actually spoke at UK Construction with last week about the design principles um, that need to be thought about when designing inclusive spaces and had a really positive reaction from contractors. I think there's always been a tendency in the industry for projects to go through the design phase and then a contractor gets that project and tends to value engineer a lot of the um, accessibility features uh, out of the project, where if they don't value engineer the feature, they will certainly downgrade the look and feel of that particular space, which creates these these rather kind of second, um, second best uh, facilities. So I'd urge you to think about engaging, you know, your, the contractors that are working on your projects as early as possible. They have a responsibility as part of the process, um, and they are listening. You know, there was a there, there was a, a real um, there was a real shift happening in the construction and, and realization that we need to be designing more accessible. Yeah, thanks. And and while you're here, there's another one for you, Ed, <laughs> that has come in. Um, can you share some examples of design choices? So um, th this individual said that uh, they're they're trying to push accessible designs within there, but it'd be nice to know what is out there. Quite a broad question that I suppose it depends slightly on the sector that they're working in, whether that's accommodation or workplace design. Um, I, I would I would highlight um, that there are a number of case studies on the Motion Spot website which gives some really good examples of what's possible when designing really beautiful accessible workplaces, uh, hotels, um, healthcare facilities, leisure um, uh, environments. There are two white papers on there, actually, that are free to download. One for inclusive workplace design and the other, a very hot topic that's being discussed today around um, how to design wheelchair accessible toilets and what are the design principles that need to go in that. Um, including that, I know uh, Visit England uh, have, have got some, some really good sort of case studies around you know, accommodation that has embraced accessibility and the advantage that they found um, in doing so. So, you know, let's, let's share as many of these case studies as possible. Absolutely. Learn from others and uh, adapt and adapt for, for your own businesses is certainly what we, we approach here in uh, at purple uh, and i think we've just got finally one question and it's for um paul i have time for one more question um you mentioned um support passports uh, uh disability passports within the within the organization um can um well um sorry what's the question um so can you just explain a little bit more about what these are and how they're used 
Yeah, so I, I think um, our members of staff have them and they're able to share them, I guess, with other people in the organisation um, to say, obviously, that they have certain types of disability. So it just makes it a little bit more inclusive. And I guess they don't have to have, you know, a conversation um, necessarily out loud. Um, the same, you know, the same way as well as we use the... Um, sunflower hidden disabilities passports as well so i think it just makes that conversation a little bit more inclusive yeah absolutely so um it's 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 where your information around your needs your adjustments um um for, for from an uh, from an employee's perspective and that moves around with you in the business as you move around into different roles and you may get a different line manager and and that information can be shared with them with their knowledge so that they know exactly and they don't have to have these conversations over and over and over and over again. So uh, that's that's the purpose of it. And and they've also said, well done for all the initiatives that you've led on at So congratulations on that. I think I think we've come to the end of the session. We've we certainly uh, run out of time, and we have covered a lot of ground on this session. There has been lots and lots of information. Oh, sorry, lots and lots of information um, um, shared uh, to to consider when you're wanting to truly. Uh, deliver an accessible customer experience and you know looking at assistive technology right through to inclusive design principles the built environment the digital environment you know and I, I think you know all the information that we've shared here today really needs to be embraced by organizations who are really considering um, engaging with the disability market and attracting more disabled people and their families through their doors whether that be physically or virtually I want to extend a huge thank you to our panelists today. Um, your contribution has been absolutely fantastic. And I want to extend a huge thanks to our partners and to our ambassadors um, who without their support, we wouldn't have been able to uh, undertake uh, this, uh, this session. Um, so I look forward to all, welcome you all in the next one. Um, it will be uh, hosted by Mike and that is at 1 p.m. UK time. And we'll be looking at global tech trends practice and innovation. So another one uh, not to be missed. And uh, thank you all for your time today. Speak to you all soon. Thank you.